just home and love. The story today. Welcome to the Alapra Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. This is Arnold Glimsher, demoted to share. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, that's good. Welcome to the penultimate No Merry Interlude that this podcast is experiencing. So we have this podcast and one more before she returns. So Merry fans, all one of you, I'm just joking, all of you, never fear. The team is going to be complete uh, very soon. But until then, uh, you're stuck with me. So that means another edition of Storytime and me hawking the horrendous stories I'm inflicting on the world. I hope the week since you've heard the previous podcast, or maybe you heard it today, well, the week since it was uploaded has found you well, and that you are having a fantastic week, and you're learning a lot, and doing your thing here, there, and everywhere. This edition of Storytime is called Gun Toting Bitches of the Canine Kind. So, not up there with great expectations as novel titles, but, um, you know, it works in its own way. Basically, it is about the world of blogging. And I don't know how many of you listeners out there are bloggers. I presume you have read blogs in your, in your lifetime. Uh, because these are the the preferred means of communication now. They're short, snappy, and uh, can be bullet pointed, which saves time when you're reading in the metro. And in general, because we uh, don't have any attention span anymore. Now, I have a long history with blogs and a love-hate relationship with them. Now, I've earned money through them. Not enough, truth be told. And I have learned fantastic things and fascinating things uh, through writing them. I was lucky enough to write for one uh, for uh, over a year and a half um, for a blog based in Australia. Now I've never, well I have been to Australia but I don't live there so I'm not a Melbourneian person. So I don't know how much advice you can take from me, an Irish guy living in Madrid about the best top 10 cafes uh, to uh, to experience in Melbourne in the central business district. But, um, you know, based as it is on intuition and uh, things I've read on the, on the sides of milk cartons. But it is interesting because you do learn about places and you have this concept of the armchair traveler. And if you're a blogger, you are an armchair traveler and an armchair bullshitter because you are basically writing about these these things. Now, everything has its, has its language. Everything has its tenor, its voice, its its way of expressing itself. I've just finished a book uh, called Here Come, uh, sorry, Here Are the Young Men, which is an Irish novel about four Dublin lads. And uh, a lot of characters speak in that Dublin patter, you know, and when I read it, it's very easy to to imagine it and to and to live it and, and, and picture it in my mind and, and hear it and also it gives me the urge to replicate it because it's kind of fun and you're playing with language and you're exploring it. Now I've been reading Laurie Lee's book as well and I'm I'm at the halfway point now. So I'm on summer. I've gone through winter, spring, um, uh, summer. Now I'm I'm halfway through that section and then finally autumn will will be the one to finish that. And he does that sometimes where he's talking about villages in, in the north of England and uh, the pattern they use and it's, it's harder for me to grapple with that because it's not familiar to me so when the character starts speaking in this way 
Now, if it was in a movie or whatever, it, it's very easy to absorb it. But when you're reading it, I find myself just kind of glazing over it and not really taking it in. And I have to force myself to go back and actually read it properly. Um, so it's interesting how when you're not used to a, a way of speaking, sometimes it can enchant you. Other times it can be a bit of a stumbling block in the narrative. And you have to kind of dig a little bit deeper uh, and force yourself to to get the grips with it and experience it. Now, it is a fantastic book, um, really riveting book, and I shall discuss why that momentarily, but I've gone off on a tangent, and I wanted to talk about blogs. Now, blogs, if there's ever a, a way of writing that necessitated heavy use of the exclamation mark, and there's not many, uh, it's definitely the blog, because it's something that's supposed to shout at you and end with things like calls of action. Now, my thing with blog is, I don't really, with blogs, I don't really like the whole SEO side of things and making things SEO ready and Google friendly and, and making sure the text is, is, you know, ready and primed to be landed on the first page of the Google uh, search. Um, so if you search for that phrase related to the article, it'll come up uh, in the top 10 and hopefully in the, in the, in the top 10 and in the, uh, uh, and you'd be able to find it and read it and enjoy it. Now, it's part of my job. I've I've been doing it for lots of blogs. Uh, it's easy, so I can't complain about it too much. But uh, it's just not very fulfilling. I prefer writing just for the sake of writing. And um, with the Australian blog, uh, I've learned things about the city. I've, I've been there. It is a beautiful city, very cultural. I never realized how cultural it actually was. There are a ton of bookshops there. Uh, a lot of these bookshops have, have won awards. It, this is thriving theater scene and obviously it's very cosmopolitan um in the city um so when you think of australia maybe you think of sports because you know it is very successful when it comes to sport um and i remember reading uh, in a newspaper once an australian writer who won a big uh, writing prize and she kind of criticized australians for having no culture now this is a thing because there are certain things that you learn uh, vicariously through other people and you might never come back to those things uh, because you just never think of them or the circumstances never push you to think about it but then when you're reading about culture and bookshops in Melbourne you think about it and you realize you know that story takes on a more interesting dimension because maybe she has or had some issue with Australia maybe her criticisms were valid I honestly don't know um, but from what I can gather from my experience of writing for the blog it's, it is a really interesting place for ideas and for books and even for coffee shops uh you know which is such a banal thing to write about but there is a coffee shop in a australian in the melbourne metro um which apparently is quite good so and yeah you find yourself writing about things that are just you know how do you make friends and how do you um you know, enjoy being an expat or speaking a second language. And, you know, these are fundamental questions. You know, on one Facebook group yesterday, one guy genuinely asked the question, how do you make friends? And uh, I didn't bother reading it because, uh, you know, I'm a busy man, but it got a huge response. And I only read those Facebook groups with expat teachers because um, when there's something horrendously... Um, awful about the post or the reaction and you want to see um humanity responding to it um so these are things that people do think about and are crucial questions uh, you might be familiar with the with the fact that the uk have appointed a minister for loneliness um but i just don't think a blog is capable of really grappling with these things and i'm just kind of tired of, of writing um articles that are just about uh hey check out this place it's amazing yeah let's live life all the time um and the blog is a weird thing as well because I was, I was editing another blog which was based in the states um and it was a uh, a blog for chronic pain sufferers of which i am not one uh, so i'm very lucky in that regard and the stories were interesting because you would hear again horrendous things um and you feel sorry for the people who are are suffering from that but in a 600 to 800 word blog 
uh, post, it just seems so difficult to really describe fully the implications and the shades and the, the touches, the tones of their particular stories. And I, I don't know if they're right, if, if it's because they're writing their second language sometimes or because of their cultural background, but it was very often a case of X and Y and Z happened you know, terrible things, and then suddenly, if you have the right attitude, everything was okay. Um, so, it's fascinating, but, I mean, you can't deny people their their experience and their story and, and how they interpret it, but uh, I just never really saw a blog story related to their experiences that really articulated um, that fundamental moment where things started to change, uh, even though they did go into, into very insightful detail about the, the background to the condition and everything so you know blogs are grand so i keep getting job offers for them uh about everything and under the sun from from literally this week i've received offers for uh getting a gun you know to uh, write a blog about about guns and, and scopes and then another one about dogs and then one about men's grooming and um you know a part of it does appeal to me because i i don't read about those things in particular, I read widely, but you wouldn't really be reading too much about gun scope, so you would pick up interesting things here and there, which is what teaching does give you. You know, you're giving classes about sleep uh, or cashless society in China, and you kind of develop interesting discussions sometimes, and you learn uh, what happens when you don't sleep for 11 days uh, and things like this. And, and apparently there are A people and B people and bee people are, are night owls, they don't uh, work very well in the mornings, they're more productive later in the day, and some people argue that society should be more reflective of bee people's needs. Now, you can think that's a whole load of codswallop, or you can think there's some value in that, but you know, maybe it's not something that you think about, but when you are doing things um, outside of your normal pattern, uh, such as teaching, where you can teach about lots of different things that you wouldn't maybe normally consider or when you're writing blogs when they're definitely about very specific sub subjects that you've never spoken about or thought about before. Uh, so it can add to your life in, in, a, in, in interesting ways, but then again, you also think, do I really want to be, be writing um, about, um, you know, flowers uh, that grow exclusively uh, in soil on the south side of hills in Tuscany. I don't know. <laughs> so that was me uh, being uh, a complete pain in the arse uh, complaining. But uh, I want to take a short musical interlude. And when I come back, you're going to hear that story. And you are going to hear some insightful things. Now, before I do that, and uh, here's another tangent alert. Um, this chapter isn't related to what I'm going to talk about now, but I have been reading a little bit about St. Patrick. And his story is quite interesting because I always thought he was a bit of an owl bollocks, you know, like an owl grumpy man. And that's actually not true. Uh, he, uh, well, maybe it was true, but he wrote a book called Confessions when he was older. And uh, the voice that comes true is of a man who's of flesh and blood and, and seems like a decent enough guy, uh, to be fair. And again, similar to what I said about Laurie Lee's book. Uh, he does the whole and God, glory to be God and God la 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 glory and all that kind of stuff and we start going into the religious uh, eulogies not because I'm anti-religious but just because it's so repetitive and and kind of antiquated in its phrasing you kind of try you kind of gloss over it but it's basically put in motion by an event where uh, he confided in one of his friends about something he did when he was a teenager uh, or something that was a long time ago. For some reason, that friend buckled and told other bishops about it, and they decide that he had to confess. Um, and in this confession, he talks about like how his friend hurt him, but how how he grieves for his friend, how he was homesick for his family and and for for the UK, but he stayed in Ireland because it was God's will. Uh, but how they did great work in converting lots of Irish to Catholicism, and how he paid lots of kings and princes to release uh, Christian captives. And it is a story that is his story and talks about how he's a slave and, and his escape and uh, also as well as insecurities because he talks about how uh, he didn't have enough education compared to other people and they were probably better suited to preaching and spreading the word of God. And so even in his writing, he felt he, he had to justify it and say, look, this isn't as good as other people uh, could do it, but this is my story and I hope you bear with me. Uh, but he came from a rich family, so I think 
you know, he he was educated. Uh, so he didn't have to be, to worry too much about uh, making a complete arse of himself. And obviously he didn't because it's, it's a seminal book. He also wrote a letter to to uh, some soldiers who uh, were guilty of, of capturing Christians and selling them off into slavery, of which Patrick uh, had first-hand testimonies. Uh, you know, he, so he knew himself personally how, how terrible those things were. Um, and even just to mention briefly Laura Lee's book, he continues with fantastic things. Uh, but there's one story where he uh, left England uh, when he was a young man and walked around uh, Spain uh, with two pounds in his pocket and a fiddle and basically a bindle that a homeless person would have. And he walked around the whole country uh, happy out, didn't have any issues until he uh, the Civil War kind of broke out and the English rescued uh, English people. Which is what would happen today, of course, as well. And when he boarded the ship, they were given um, a salute um, and full kind of honors and everything because uh, it was, maybe it was a sign of, well, don't worry, you're coming home to merry old England and everything's going to be okay. Um, and it just it's just kind of interesting because obviously you couldn't wander around the country, uh, especially around a European country with no passport, with no money and um, no prospects. Um, but obviously he went back, as I mentioned in previous podcasts, and fought in the Spanish Civil War and fought the last romantic war in his words. So uh, again, uh, his book uh, I've mentioned in previous podcasts, um, it is fascinating. Do buy it, do read it. It was so, it's so fascinating that a guy uh, playing mu- uh, music on the Metro Busker started singing a song about it and I had to give him a euro because of that, because he did make me laugh. He actually, I actually encountered him before. He started singing a, 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 um, a song about a bottle of water I had in my bag. Uh, but I don't think I was predisposed to give him money that day. So I ignored the fucker. But uh, today I gave him a euro because he was singing the praises of Laurie Lee. Which is fair enough. So musical interlude and I'll be back with the chapter I wanted to read. Settling into some writing work, O'Donnell sighed a heavy one, saying to himself, Here we go again. He began typing, almost on autopilot, about the ten best restaurants in Algiers. The closest that man had been to Algeria was Rabat, which was the capital city of Morocco. Using his intuition and a web search, he allowed the bullshit to flow through him. He was but a mere conduit, and while he clacked on the keyboard, He knew his ease with bullshit was both a blessing and a curse. Why do you do it? Asked the Dubliner once, on the bus. Ah, you know, it makes me feel productive, O'Donnell said meekly. It wasn't for the money, he said internally. Who wrote great poetry, rock songs and restaurant compilations for the cash? There was a buzz before from weaving song lyrics into a whole passage about how to make friends when you're an expat. Now Donald found it was easier to resist the urge, back then, to simply write, be a person, go to a party. Now it was an endeavor hemmed in by the law of ever diminishing returns. His mind started to wonder, and he questioned whether a George Bellows painting could be linked to a tea room on the Algiers outskirts. Of course it could, O'Donnell was pretty damn good at the writing lark. Once he wrote something, he connected the dots afterwards, and it did make a certain kind of sense. So it was fated and fetid to huddle masses would bend to sip from cups, not freeze on a New York dock. Thus, O'Donnell could put in his author's bio something about being a pretentious arty fuck, rather than a dreamer, traveller, seeker. What other bloggers were seeking was beyond him but he was sure it wasn't a way to pull their heads out of their arses. Perhaps it was a way to end every sentence with an exclamation mark, or a question, you know? Opening a bank account in Berlin doesn't have to be a challenge. Have you tried strudel? It's a taste sensation. With the money you save in your new beaming bank account, the beers are on you, winky face. Now, get out there and explore. The truth was that O'Donnell needed the blog. He needed the sense of productivity that it brought him. 
even if the actual work itself was tedious. The idea of being an editor energized his heart just enough to keep him mildly, mildly unfulfilled. Each article kept him on his feet, on the canvas, against the ropes. Sometimes he fell through those ropes, into life, sinews stretching, illuminated by imprecations. He would land on the darkness of the people around him. The problem with blogs, in his view, was that, was that they never went anywhere. Make Mary Magdalene human and boom, you've got a painting. Blogs always existed in the commonplace, too flimsy to be heightened, already so normal, nothing converted into them could vibrate with a new voice. O'Donnell was so good at the blogs, the offers just kept rolling in. Needed, blog writer, enthusiastic about guns and rifle scopes. On other days, he was asked to write about dogs, the stock market, violins and cheesy crust. One of these days, O'Donnell would write his masterpiece, a 600-word SEO-friendly post about gun-toting bitches of the canine kind, leaving funeral violins and celebratory cheesy crust in their wake. Who wouldn't put that on the first page of Google? O'Donnell sighed again. At least, he thought to himself, he only had two more Algerian restaurants to write about. Search for the Elaborate Podcast on your podcast app, on Twitter, YouTube, and our website, elaboratemedia.com.